Hey, it's Erica. I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to Global News What Happened To ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. It starts with seven words on the screen. Nothing is more powerful than an idea. The 30-minute video released in March 2012 sheds light on a brutal war that had ravaged parts of Uganda for decades. Villages burned. Rebels brutalized civilians. The conflict spilled into neighboring countries, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Central African Republic. The creators of the film wanted people to get a harrowing glimpse into the atrocities of this war and learn about the people responsible. They also wanted to make the rebel group's leader famous in hopes it would lead to his capture. It's been almost 10 years since it was released. And I have had many listeners of this podcast write in and ask what has happened since. Over the next two episodes, we'll dig into the film and find out what happened to the man at the heart of it. You'll also hear from survivors of the terror and pain inflicted upon them and hundreds of thousands of others living in Uganda, Congo, and other parts of Africa. And we'll take a deep dive into the viral campaign that got the world's attention. I'm journalist Erica Vela, and this is part one of Global News What Happened to Coney 2012. The video starts with Jason Russell, an activist and co-founder of Invisible Children. He tells us that the world is more connected than ever before and gives us an inside look into his life. My name is Jason Russell, and this is my son, Gavin. We hear about the work he does with a not-for-profit organization based in the U.S. Who are you to end a war? I'm here to tell you, who are you not to? About four minutes in, we are introduced to a man named Jacob and hear his harrowing story. We were the rebel when they raised us again. Then they, they will kill us. Jacob lived in northern Uganda as war terrorized civilians and children were abducted to be trained as child soldiers. Rebels burned villages. They were members of the Lord's Resistance Army, led by warlord Joseph Kony. The video has one clear message. It wants to make Kony a household name. Not to celebrate him, but to bring his crimes to the light. And we are starting this year, 2012. We are targeting 20 culture makers and 12 policymakers to use their power for good. Invisible Children hoped that the video would put pressure on the international community to find Coney and bring him to justice. On the screen, we see photos of Rihanna, Mark Zuckerberg, and Oprah, among other celebrities. Then policymakers, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and then Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Our goal is to change the conversation of our culture and get people to ask, who is Joseph Kony? We have printed hundreds of thousands of posters, stickers, yard signs, and flyers that are right now, today, being put up in major cities all over the world. Viewers are asked to cover the night on April 20th, 2012. This is the day when we will meet at sundown and blanket every street in every city till the sun comes up. We will be smart and we will be thorough. The rest of the world will go to bed Friday night and wake up to hundreds of thousands of posters demanding justice on every corner. It was meant to get the viewer engaged. And in the end, viewers were tasked with three action items. To sign the pledge and show support to get an action kit consisting of two bracelets and posters of Coney to put around their neighborhoods to make him infamous, and to donate. The campaign Coney 2012 mobilized people to find Joseph Coney, the leader of the LRA. If you go on YouTube right now, you'll see the video has over 100 million views. Many of us learned about Kony through this film, but the Lord's Resistance Army goes back decades to 1987 when it first formed. So before we get into Kony 2012, 
We need to find out how it all started before that. I turned to Laura C., an assistant professor of government at Colby College in Maine. She studied the LRA and Joseph Coney since 2010. So one interesting thing about Joseph Coney is that his name is Joseph Coyne, um, if you pronounce it in the local language. There are, um, you know, it has to do with, with linguistic differences in southern Uganda, why people call him Coney. The proper pronunciation is Konya. It's sort of like Konyak, always telling about the advocacy movement that they never pronounced his name correctly. The LRA emerged within Uganda in the 80s. You know, a lot of times when we talk about conflict in Africa, we talk about civil wars, we talk about uh, non-state armed groups, as we call groups like the LRA. It's often like one group of people attacking a group of people who are different from them, right? So they might be of a different ethnicity, speak a different language, or be of a different religious belief, or be in a different, you know, area of the country. Um, and what's what's kind of unique and, and really frightening, I guess, about Northern Uganda is that it was a movement from inside. So it's a movement of Northern Ugandans, especially people, although not exclusively, but especially people from the Acholi ethnic group, going after their own people. Their ideology has long been debated, and many experts say it's unclear what guides the rebel group. The role of abduction and the use of children uh, in the violence is particularly horrifying. And, you know, just really that most of the people fighting for the LRA were doing so because they were forced to fight for the LRA. They didn't have any choice. Um, and, you know, that's mostly young boys, a few girls, but but mostly boys. And, the, and then girls being forced into domestic servitude, sexual slavery, um, some combination thereof to support the activities of the group. Uh, it's just it's just horrific. And I think, you know, anyone who, who isn't moved by that, there's probably some questions to be asked, right? Like, like you should feel terrible about this because it's a terrible, terrible situation. In order to understand how and why the LRA formed, it's important to understand some of the history of Uganda. So this goes way back into the colonial history of Uganda, where the British um, who colonized the country favored Southerners, um, and the North was seen as sort of a place where laborers came from. Um, but there were not educational opportunities for most Northerners. There were not opportunities to, you know, come to own a business and advance in, in the ways that Southerners were allowed to do. And so I think some of those grievances, you know, long-standing grievances, the North has always been behind the South in terms of its economic development and the opportunities that people have. And they play into that. Scott Ross is an anthropologist and graduate student at George Washington University. He said that in the early 80s, the president of Uganda villainized the North. Yaweri yeah, Museveni is waging his own civil war to try to take power in Uganda. And part of how he consolidated a following and, and executed his sort of leadership once he took power was by blaming problems on the Northerners, by identifying Acholi specifically, but a, a, really the North as sort of... Um, the enemies of sort of his state and and you know ethnic politics and issues have existed in different ways but it was really under me 70 like he further sort of ethnicized politics in uganda um and so once he takes power in 86 the sort of dominoes fall from there as he tries to consolidate power in the margins of the country this stokes, you know, responses from the people in these regions. The Yawari Museveni sees Northerners as the enemy, and he, he, he depicts them as such when he comes to power. And when he comes to power, he basically launches a counterinsurgency in the North, even though there's no rebellion yet. And this counterinsurgency is actually what creates a bunch of sort of anti-government um, sympathy and mobilization, like the LRA and other groups. In 1986, Yuweri Museveni became president of Uganda. There had been a lot of fighting within the country, and many anti-government rebel groups had begun to form. One of those rebel groups was led by Alice Lequena. She became a prominent Acholi leader, creating the Holy Spirit Movement. The Holy Spirit Movement is, is what it's sometimes called. It was a, a purification movement, an idea that... Um, you know, Acholi people kind of had to repent of things that they had done wrong, had to band together under this very specific vision 
Uh, she claimed to be possessed by a spirit um, that kind of guided the group in its activities. Her initial interest was taking control of Gulu and Kitgum, two districts in the north. But as the Holy Spirit movement grew, so did her hopes of taking down Museveni's government. The group was largely unsuccessful, and Laquena fled Uganda. But out of that movement, another was inspired. A person claimed to have similar spiritual powers as Laquena. His name was Joseph Kony. In 1987, Joseph Kony took over as commander of the newly formed Lord's Resistance Army. There's this intense spiritual importance to Joseph Cohen and his pronouncements. Um, and his followers were taught, and you know, by all accounts, most of them genuinely believe that he could use spiritual forces to control their actions. He could use spiritual forces to uh, protect them in battle um, or to not protect them, right, if they weren't loyal and didn't do what they were supposed to do. So I think he, he kind of plays that that dual role, a sort of spiritual leader, guru type figure, and a a very brutal military commander uh, at the same time. Under his command, it's estimated that over 100,000 people have been killed. Tens of thousands of children abducted and made into soldiers. And Jolie Okot was one of them. And she experienced firsthand the horrors of the LRA. Jolie is an Acholi, She lives in Gulu, a city in northern Uganda. In the late 80s, she went to school like any other day. We had no idea. We had no clue that there was war. So what used to happen because of lack of transport, whenever I would be coming back to school, I would have to walk for 12 miles to come back home. So one day when we were asked to go back home from school, I went to the very point where the bus always leave us on the main road. And I started walking down to come back to my home, to my parents. And then on the way, as I was coming back, I found a roadblock. I didn't understand what that roadblock was all about. And uh, initially, actually, I thought it was the government soldiers that were mounted that roadblock. And then they stopped me from about... 50 meters away, they asked me to stop. So they told me that you're not going home. You have to stay here. So when I stopped and uh, I saw by my side, there was a commander who was shooting the legs of people with a pistol. And I was scared to death. So they gave me an option. I rather go and join the team that uh, were being shot at, or I accept uh, peacefully to stay with them. Jolie said she had witnessed brutal killings. She was trained to be a soldier and was taught how to use a gun and fight in battle. It was very difficult because I had to go to my neighbors, I had to go to people I know, and forcefully, with a gun, ask them to give food, money or anything they have to support the troop. So that happened to me for two years. At night, she was taken by grown men and sexually assaulted. For two years, her only goal was survival. That was until another member of her family was taken. Jolie's father was a teacher and opposed the LRA. On a journey back from Kampala, he was taken and held by the rebel group. I was still in the rebel uh, army as well, so I would go and visit. But then I realized that after three or four days, they had already put them amongst the people to be killed. So I went and talked to my dad. He called me to tell me his last words. Being an elder child, he said, if I die, these are the people you need to contact so that you can leave the village and go to them. Instead, she came up with a plan. And I asked my dad, I said, how many people are guarding you at night? So my dad told me there's one man with an AK-47 
So I told my dad, I said, I am returning at night to come and rescue you. My dad said, no, you are young. Let me die other than you dying. I said, no, daddy, don't worry. I am coming back. So I went again as these words. I went back home and I picked my AK-47. I picked my grenades. I had about 10 grenades that I strapped around my waist. I threw a grenade and then I started firing like in the air. The diversion worked. That night, eight prisoners escaped, including Jolie's father, and they ran nearly 100 kilometers to safety. In 1989, Jolie was finally free from the grips of the LRA, but retaliation soon followed. Jolie said rebels went to her village and killed members of her extended family. As long as the reign of the LRA continued, she wanted to help survivors and let the world know what was happening in Uganda. She began working with non-governmental organizations. I started with Oxfam, Medicine San Frontiers, or Doctors Without Borders, and uh, uh, International Christian Aid, uh, that was actually called Inter-Aid. And uh, the war was still going on. And uh, my goal was to actually uh, help and let the story of the war be known. When she returned from a trip to the U.S., she moved back to Gulu in northern Uganda to help people in her own community. From the late 80s onward, the LRA's grip on the people of Uganda continued. I wanted to speak with someone who lived under their looming threat and met Dominic Akena, He lives in Toronto now, but he grew up in Patongo Village, which is about 140 kilometers east of Gulu. It's uh, one of the farthest points in northern Uganda. It's uh, it's close to South Sudan and generally close to that area of Central African Republic. It's it's that, that region of Uganda. Dominic has two brothers and two sisters. He says his father wasn't around a lot, so they were mostly raised by their mother, his childhood was filled with long days playing outside with friends. We would make this animated slingshots and we would go bird hunting and we'd go fishing and things like that and play lots of different kind of sports. You know, we'd do our own track and field. So I just remember being really happy as a kid. All this green space, just being absolutely worry free. All you wake up every day morning, like, wake up, what are we doing today? Fishing or whatever? It was July 2001. Dominic was seven years old when he was woken up early one morning by bright lights coming from a neighboring village a few kilometers away. And we can hear people scream in the distance and we were very confused as kids. And then as the, as adult, my mother started to kind of shove us into the woods. So like, let's, you know, let's leave the house. Let's go sleep in the woods. We don't know what this is. You know, everybody, things, animals, you know, noise that you normally don't hear on a normal day. Uh, and then la- later on in the morning, we, we learned that uh, several people had been killed, like um, in a village next door, that the rebel came around with people that abducted children, um, you know, killed uh, elderly people. And that is that was one of the most um, terrifying experience for our neighbor- neighboring village. That day marked the end of Dominic's innocent childhood. Days playing in the sun without a care in the world were over. Now he lived under the threat that the LRA would attack his village, his home, at any moment. There was no way of knowing where and when the rebels would attack next. They abduct children. Uh, if you have young children, they will abduct them. And nobody knew at the time. Why would they abduct children? Nobody knew at the time. Again, this is the all concept of child soldiers is not, it's new to us, right? So nobody could give us information what these rebels would do. Dominic said each night his family would head to the woods. Every day I would have to listen to my mother uh, alongside my four-headed sibling when my mother said, it's time to go, it's no messing around. And that started to really change in my head as a kid growing up. I used to be free, all of that. I would play until nightfall, no worries, come home, whatever. And now I can't be home after 7 p.m. or I can't be anywhere else after 7 p.m. That happened for, you know, we started to sleep outside, you know, in the wood. Um, 
for you know every night now rain or shine every night because the the model of thinking about this rebel is that you don't know what they're going to do they show up at any time you could be sleeping you could your kid could be over there you could be over here they could be sn- so you kind of you know you started to mold your thinking into the survival mode of looking over your shoulder at all time he had no idea who the LRA rebels were or what they looked like as a 7 year old his imagination ran wild my first image of the rebels was not even people. I thought there was some kind of animalistic, you know, non-human entity that, you know, like they had to be that in order, because they sound too brutal to be just like a normal human. So uh, naturally, I was curious to see what the, rebel, what the famous rebel looked like as a kid. And as a kid, I didn't take that seriously because I was 100% interested in seeing what the rebels was, you know, what, like how dangerous are these things? And then... The rebel didn't come to our village for a while. It didn't take. It took a while from to, to get to our village. You know, I was always just kind of like, oh, hearing adults talk about it. They attacked this village right here. They attacked this another village right here. I heard that they, they, they rounded these people up. They, they cut up lips and heels of people, and, and so it was like very, very scary stuff. And as I grew older, I, you know, I can sense the frustration in my mother, sort of trying to keep us all safe. The weeks turned into months, which turned into years. It became routine for Dominic and his family. For us, at 3 p.m., as soon as, because there's no light, there's no, as soon as you can't see anyone anymore, it's like, they could be rebels, they could be your neighbor, you don't know. But so the only way to be safe is to take yourself out, go find a hiding spot in the forest. And there are wild stuff in the forest too. I got malaria myself just from sleeping outside. I think if I can remember being sick over 15 times from just a regular walking of malaria, one day I'll be coming with like this fever. Um, as a six, seven year old, like fever after fever. I, I like at one point I got fever and yellow fever, malaria and yellow fever all combined at the same time. So I don't know how I survived all that, but it was, you know, and there's like other stuff like snakes and like other wildlife and that I wasn't like prepared to kind of deal with. So all of that was very terrifying. For three years, Dominic's family successfully evaded the rebels. But he was tired of making the nightly trips to the forest. Dominic says he was nine years old when he and his brother, Okello Sisto, decided they wouldn't sleep in the forest that night. Instead, they would sleep in a classroom in their village. We kind of had the same mentality. It was like, we really, you know, we're tired of going to sleep in the woods every time, you know, especially when it rains, it's just so uncomfortable. So we were like, we're going to go, we, we decided to go sleep in the classroom building that we study in during the day. The two, me and him, we had that idea. And we did not go to sleep in the wood that day. So we slept in a, in a classroom building because we thought, first of all, there's a protected concrete, you know, the, the windows and the doors are steel and there's no, you know, we're safe. We thought we're safe. Dominic and his brother weren't alone. There were other children in the classroom as well. They kept quiet, listening closely, and just as they drifted off to sleep. We started to hear you know, a bang on the door, flashlight all over the place, screaming, and it was just chaotic. And then one person came and opened the door that easily. Um, so we just, I thought that somebody, now they broke the window and stuff like that, but somebody got out and opened the door. And it all went mayhem after that. And that was the first time, I, that night was the first time I saw the rebel as a nine-year-old boy now. As the rebels came in, chaos and confusion reigned in the absolute darkness. The only light came from flashlights. Dominic said he clung to his brother's side. And he was holding me tight. He was like, don't let go. You know, um, we're going we're gonna to be okay. He was telling me that. But, you know, after they came and hit me with a flashlight, and then they rip him apart. Uh, you know, that was, that was it. It was so dark, and everything felt like, like a dramatic lit-up scene where, like, you're looking at blackness and light at the same time. Everything's so intense, and you're getting pushed around. You're getting hit by things, and you think you're going to die. I felt like that was the moment I was going to die. And so I just kept my head down. Um, and, and all this other noise, I could just hear other kids screaming, being I don't. I didn't see anything that happened because it's it just hard. To, it's just hard to focus on one thing. Um, while all this entire time, I was thinking, "Oh my God, 
this animalistic rebel are going to kill me tonight. And then slowly I started to hear a human voice, but it's still violent. It's still, it's still all of that. That was the moment Dominic realized that the members of the LRA were actually humans. I was just thinking about, I'm going to die. Like, I've heard this, this that, that rebels do this to kids. They kill kids. They, they, they chop up your ears. They cut up your lips. I'm going to die tonight. And I was just trying to do whatever it takes to not die in that moment. As the first rays of light broke through, Dominic was alive. But the horrors were just beginning. He says members of the LRA split everyone up into smaller groups. Dominic and his brother were separated. In my head, I thought I was screaming and holding on to him. I don't know if I had energy. I don't know if I did that, but like he, he just... It, it just took him. And, and again, at the same time, if I'm remembering correctly, I'm just trying to not die. So I was like froze again. I was like frozen. And, and I could see that like, he was looking at me and said like, you know, he's, he's shaking. We were just, I was just crying and trying, like I was shaking uncontrollably, trying not to die. And, 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 um, and I just saw him take him away. It was the last time he saw his brother, Okello. He was now alone. I just kept walking forward. We kept shoveling forward until we, until we disappeared um, into, you know, like, like just on the side of, the, we, got, we had the building, we had the compound, and, you know, underneath some big trees, we disappeared there, like without a trace. Time stood still. Dominic didn't know if days, weeks, or even months had passed. He was just nine years old, now trying to survive. I felt like I was in a state of froze, like, like a frozen body the whole time. Like, move, you die. Don't move, you die. Like, just how did, maybe my size, I was very small. I was, like, just probably one of the smallest kids in the team. So what came to me felt like a lot, but I felt like if, if I, you know, I felt like if I just stayed numb, maybe if I, if I stayed in this mental state of, if you want to come and kill me now, let's, let's just do it. But I'm not going to run. I'm not going to scream. He was assigned a commander who watched his every move. I carried his weapon, I carried his shoes, I carried his food. Um, and, and his job was to make sure that I don't escape and I become trained and I become a soldier. And, and so if he does that successfully, that is his recruit. Um, but if I were, if I escape, that's bad news for him. They will ask him where I am and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So he was very brutal on me and he was just like... But then over time, I learned just, to, you know, coping mechanism and strategy of just not trying to be killed. Like, he asked me to do, go get me water. I'll go do it. His future, unknown. His home, his family, his childhood all snatched away. Like Jolie before him, Dominic was trained as a soldier and carried guns bigger than his little body could handle. There were moments he would think back to those days spent playing with other children in his village. Moments where he and his brother would talk about the rebels and conjured up images of what they looked like. And now he was staring those very monsters in the eye. It felt very real because a month before that, my childhood friends and I were staging this gunfight because it's been going on for so long now that the government soldiers came into our village and so, conceptually, we start to think of war as like shooting between government and the rebel. And, and we would divide up, my friends and I would divide up into two teams. One team would be the rebels and the other team would be like the government soldiers. And <clears throat> it was this moment where I feel like this was, wasn't a game. I was being asked to do it. Joseph Coney had been leading the LRA since the late 80s, so Dominic was familiar with the name. Uh, I overheard my mom talk to a neighbor saying that we hear that there's this man named Joseph Coney, and he, he, told, he told the rebel people to go to certain village and do this, and he give orders. That's, that's, what he, that's what they say. This man give orders. Most of his orders are to kill people uh, and then to abduct children, and then uh, loot properties and animals and food. Dominic said Coney was not only known as a ruthless killer, 
Adults also talked about his magical powers. As a kid, I got hooked on that. And uh, believe, uh, I, believe me, when, you know, in my village, uh, I grew up in a, in a very, like, my village is very nice people, but we are very superstitious. We are very, be, we believe in, you know, all things nature. We believe in spirits and power. And so there's a certain type of power that they say that he has. And, and it's the worst kind, right? It's like the, the kind that you don't, for us, it's the kind you don't want to mess with. First power is the power of invisibility. That is invisible, that you can get surrounded by a army of the government and the helicopter, and then pff, it will disappear and it will be just smoke. So as a kid hearing that, I was like, well, that's the power I would never mess with. He heard stories of Coney's ability to read minds. As a kid, that's a power you can never beat. If somebody can just do that to you, you I, I was like, I, don't, I never want to meet this man because what if I accidentally think about killing him and he, he and I you know my brain just went like oop you know and then and then it goes like get that kid bring him over here so the fear that was around this man and 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 what what he embodied uh was was above you know what any of us could comprehend so it created a lot of fear while captive he feared the day he would have to face Coney after weeks of brutal training Dominic said one day, commanders approached the new recruits, and his biggest fear was coming true. They were like, okay, we're about to start the journey to go, uh, um, we're about to go, to go uh, because the uh, part of the abduction ceremony is that if you are not blessed by Connie uh, at a battle, at, at, at a gunfight, you are going to catch a bullet. But if, you gotta, if you've got a spell put on you by, by our supreme leader, Joseph Connie, and you're untouchable, just like him. So we just started walking to some direction that I don't know. And it must have been 25 to 30 kilometers before we took our foot break. Um, and then everybody was like, st- like tired after that. It was the afternoon. And then we settled there. We built this makeshift camp for the night. And we stayed there. Fearful that with one look, Coney would be able to see the anger and fear that bubbled inside of him. Dominic felt lost, unsure of what to do. So I just avoided that and snuck out of the group at night and just kept running. Uh, I kept running. Like, I've never, I never ran so far and so long and so hard in my entire life. After I got away for a few feet, I just kept running into the darkness. You know, it could be a desk. It could be, it could be a river. It could be whatever. It could be, and it, it could be anything. I was just like, I need to go. After enduring months of torture and pain, living in fear and not knowing if he would die, he escaped and ran for hours as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Several days passed before he came across a village. And when he arrived, it was eerily quiet. It looked abandoned, but Dominic said he saw an elderly man he is the guy who said no to the government. The government of Uganda came around and swept everybody from their village, from your land, and say, hey, this is a strategy we're doing. We want to combat this rebel. So we're going to take everybody who is a civilian and bring them into this internally displaced camp so we can set up like our military patrolling operation 24 hours a day. That way, if you're a rebel and you're still out there, we know, and then it's easy to get you. Um, so that's, that's how the theory of IDP camp became. The camps that Dominic is referring to are IDP camps, internally displaced persons camps. We'll go into more detail in the next episode, but these camps were put in place by the Ugandan government during the war, and it's estimated that at its peak, Almost 2 million people in Uganda lived in these IDP camps. Getting back to Dominic's story, the elderly man took him in and treated his wounds. Eventually, he was reunited with his mother and family who were living at one of these IDP camps. So the reunion with my family was surreal. I, I, my mother wasn't expecting me to return. And there was lots of questions because two of us were abducted and now I was returning home by myself. You know, there's a lot of crime. My mother's, I was just like, you know, what the hell is going on? I was like, you know, in, in my head, I've been so 
filled with violence that I didn't want to, you know, didn't want to see any of that people. So it felt very overwhelming, and I just left him by, <laughs> and then sat, sat by myself at the corner of, my, you know, the mud hut for the rest of the day. Um, for very long, didn't talk to anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. Um, just trying to process thing for for a little while, and I didn't talk about anything. I didn't ask it. I didn't answer any question. It was just weird to be back all of a sudden in a non-violent, constant violent world. And then it's my family, and there's questions that they're, they're like, what did you see? Dominic sat in silence, not knowing how to respond as his family pressed for answers about his older brother, Akello. It's been very tough. Um, to be honest, it's, uh, it's not easy, but the only memory I'm hanging on to is the memory of seeing him walk away. It's, 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 it's kind of one of those things where I, I have this retained memory of him walking away, and that's all I continue to believe that's still, still what I, you know. I think about him all the time. In 2004, when Dominic was captured, the war between the LRA and the Ugandan government had been going on for decades. Villages turned to ash, countless casualties, children ripped away from their families— but it went on mostly unnoticed to the rest of the world. In 2003, three college students were determined to make a documentary about the conflict in South Sudan. Their names were Bobby Bailey, Laren Poole, and Jason Russell. While their intention was to speak with those who had fled Darfur to Uganda, their plans would take a sharp turn after witnessing the horrors committed by the LRA. Tens of thousands of children were leaving their homes in an effort to escape the rebels. Violence in the middle of the streets, watching it all unfold in front of them. Their mission would change. The young men set out to expose what they had witnessed in Uganda, screening their film at hundreds of high schools, colleges, and churches throughout the United States. In 2004, the group founded Invisible Children, as a not-for-profit charitable organization to raise funds and use the money in part to produce awareness films. The organization grew steadily, but no one could have anticipated what would come in 2012. We put Coney 2012 online and we hit 500,000 views within the first 12 hours, 24 hours, something like that. And then it just continued to build and build and build Every hour after that was like a million views an hour, and it just kept growing. And within a few days, it was being translated into all major languages around the world. And, you know, seven out of 10 of global tweets had something to do with Kony or Uganda or Invisible Children. And so that's really when we stepped into the phenomenon that is now known as Kony 2012. Next time on What Happened To, we hear from the man behind Coney 2012. Thank you for joining me this week. Global News What Happened To is written and produced by me, Erica Vela, with producer Dila Velazquez. Our audio producer is Rob Johnson. Also, thanks goes out to Drew Hasselbeck, supervising national online journalist for Global News. Let us know what you thought of this episode, and please share it with a friend. It will help us grow the show and bring you more incredible stories. You can also help us out by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can also reach out to me personally. We are always looking for stories. So if there's a new story you want us to revisit, you can reach me on Twitter at Erica Vela or email me at erica.vela at globalnews.ca. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.